Welcome to week four, everybody. Uh, this week we'll be discussing again discourses of the child and going deeper into some of the concepts that we began talking about last week. Um, so we'll be discussing the social construction of childhoods. That is, we'll be considering how notions of childhood are constructed socially in the relational domain between persons through co-constructed meaning. So we'll pay attention to how certain images of childhood are maintained through relations between individuals and the state, and how these relations inform practices of education and parenting. So some of the things to do this week for Monday, um, read Berman chapter 4, pages 67 to 86, and also read Mindy Blaze and Africa Taylor's article called Using Queer Theory to Rethink Gender Equity in Early Childhood Education. And also prepare two to three questions for your virtual collaboratories based on the readings. By Friday at 11.55 p.m., submit your weekly notes and post only one word and definition to the Word Bank Forum or add to others definitions. By Sunday at 11.55 p.m., respond to one other weekly post, and then of course participate in your group's one-hour virtual collaboratory, and be sure to record some notes in your Google Doc as you're doing that. So some questions to frame this week are, what socio-political values shape the image of the parent? What is meant by self-governance or self-surveillance? What are some ways in which self-governance or surveillance is upheld? So with this question, consider Berman's points about parenting advice, resources, pop culture, media, um, and the medicalized responses to children's behavior. Um, and there are a few other examples uh, in this chapter as well that you can think with. So within this chapter, what are some examples of how societal and structural problems manifest themselves in individual bodies? So with this question, consider the celebrity child um, discourses of humanitarian aid and medicalization. So you can use these questions as well to frame some of your conversations in the virtual collaboratory. So when we're thinking about the social construction of childhood, we're thinking of childhood um, in a way that is informed by the co-construction of meaning between persons. So this week, Berman provokes us to consider multiple constructions of childhood, and she calls us to question where our notions of childhood come from and what they do. So she sort of blurs the division of infant, child, youth, and adult, um, and our understandings of these times in development by considering the social and cultural contexts which determine each of these times in life. Um, so questions that um, might be coming up are, when does childhood end and adult begin? And according to whom? Who sets these parameters? Um, what other ways of knowing age and childhood might exist beyond a Euro-Western developmental lens? So Berman also argues that many childhood texts perpetuate a Euro-colonial view of childhood by placing cultural diversity as an add-on, considering um, as it's sort of an add-on consideration within the basis of a Westernized lens. So this is positioning Euro-Western ways of knowing childhood as a given basis and culture as an add-on or elective to an assumed pre-existing foundation. So as we discussed last week, this view of childhood is very much upheld and reproduced through the sciences of child development theory as an expansive and colonial tool. So it names a baseline of what qual a quality childhood ought to look like and how to maintain it. Um, so this is very much uh, something that's visible in child rights discourses, as Berman speaks to this week, where children's needs are treated as self-evident and neutral without consideration of the cultural contexts and times that inform um, childhood in that area. So moreover, children are positioned as uh, in a state of lack where entitlements come uh, become duties and responsibilities in the service of their development. So these child rights discourses actually um, reinforce notions of child development theory. 
So last week we discussed the child as being formed with an economic value. And this was something that was coming up in some of your conversations in the forums. So where humanity is valued only upon economic productivity and benefit. So anything that doesn't have some sort of value attached to it in um, the service of the economy loses significance and importance in society. And this is an important lens to think with in considering child and elder abuse and the ways in which children and elders are often positioned as needy or reliant um, and thus, as Berman argues, vulnerable to abuse. So what's important to consider here is the structural positioning toward victimhood where responsibility for safety is allocated in the individual without a consideration of the social histories and structures which create these conditions for abuse in the first place. So if we understand that discourses of childhood are intimately informed by political, social, and economic value, we can then examine the construction of the child subject as a tool in the service of an ongoing neoliberal and colonial desire to rationalize progress and expansion through the individual. So in this way, pop culture, media, parenting manuals, handbooks, and things of these sorts act as tools or technologies of self-governance, where the intentions and values of the state for progress and production via developmental narratives and norms are perpetuated through an individualized self-surveillance and personal comparison against others. So in this model, there's an illusion of choice and freedom in life or autonomy, as Berman argues. Um, though this perceived autonomy is regulated by dominant discourses that shape our view of how we ought to live life and what is actually a good life. So this week you've also, um, you'll also be reading um, Mindy Blaze and Africa Taylor's article on queering early childhood education. And in this article, they explain discourse. So they explain that discourse refers to a specific body of ideas or beliefs that are circulated through language and enacted by persons. So discourse gives meaning to all aspects of our worlds. It also moves with power relations, where people are positioned and affected by dominant discourses in specific ways according to their social location within a particular discourse and how much power they hold as a result of this positionality. Yet these locations, um, it's important to consider that these locations are not fixed or static. Um, these power relations are constantly shifting as humans move and are reconfigured within the world. So often these discourses are seemingly invisible and uphold normative assumptions about how we assume life ought to be. Um, so in the case of this article, gender discourses are a key focus of analysis. So the authors discuss gender discourses in early childhood education and highlight the heteronormative performances that are reproduced and upheld in early childhood spaces through children's play. So the authors argue toward a queer eye um, as a means of noticing, questioning, and responding to discourses which uphold oppressive narratives and create spaces in which multiple ways of being may become possible. So in your weekly notes this week, I invite you to try looking with this lens, looking with a queer eye to things that may be taken for granted as given or commonplace. So this brings us to your weekly notes. Oh, this is actually supposed to be week four. So this week, uh, your weekly notes will involve a critical examination of a piece of parenting advice. So you might find this online at a popular website, um, at a health office, childcare center, community center, family planning clinic, um, or a place like that where you think that they might be giving out parenting advice. So some examples of this could be parenting magazines or other resources given to families. This piece of advice should have an image included so that you can assess and look at that image. So critically examine this piece of advice and respond to the following questions. What is gender? Is the gender of the child depicted? And how do you know this? 
what is the gender of the primary caregiver? What is the gender of the professionals, if they're depicted? What is the tone of the advice offered? How are families represented? How um, culturally specified is this form of childhood depicted? And lastly, what kinds of childhoods are privileged in this account and which might be marginalized? So if you want to choose a few of these questions and really dig deeper into them, I'm okay with that. Or you can also choose to answer all the questions. Also this week, uh, post to the word bank one word and a definition um, that might be puzzling or interesting to this week, or you can also add to others' definitions. So yeah, I think that's about it for this week. Um, I've really enjoyed reading through some of your responses over the past couple weeks, and um, I encourage you to continue to respond to each other's um, posts and read them, because if you are having a hard time, sometimes it helps to read the work of others to gain a deeper understanding into some of the material. So yeah, have a great week, everybody. We'll talk soon.